the world we live in has changed dramatically in the last few months. With millions of us adapting to life under lockdown, many are struggling with self-isolating and social distancing. Now is as good a time as any to put your mind to something and develop your knowledge of nature and the outside world. We need to go back to basics, to reset the clock and focus on what really matters. We need to learn from this. In this video, I'm going to show you 20 survival tips that might help you when you find yourself out in the wilderness. Before I get into it, I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring the episode. Skillshare is an online learning community that provides thousands of courses and inspiring classes for those people looking to be creative and learn new skills to keep boredom, anxiety and lethargicness at bay. With the birth of my firstborn daughter just a few months ago, I'm trying to get used to a new life whilst maintaining my full-time job. I've been watching Greg McKeon's class on simple productivity and how to accomplish more with less. It's taught me how to prioritise and use my time more wisely, something I've never been good at. There's a variety of different classes on Skillshare, from photography to art, productivity, entrepreneurship, languages, and much more. These courses help manage stress and focus your mind. So if you're looking to further develop your knowledge and skill set, this is the place for you. Skillshare is giving away two free months of premium memberships to the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description box to help you explore your creativity. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. Now, let's learn some survival skills. Doldinia concentrica, the cramp ball fungus, also known as the coal fungus. It can be found on dead or decomposing ash trees. When dry, this fungus can take a spark from a ferrocerium rod and it can burn for many hours. As well as its use in fire lighting, it can also be used as a mosquito repellent. Simply split the top of a stick into four using your knife. Use small sticks to wedge it open. Place your smouldering cramp or fungus inside and cover with moss. This will create a pungent smoke which will deter flying bugs from your camp. These bug torches can burn for many hours and can be moved from place to place. The humble tin can. It has many uses in the survival world. Snap off the ring pull by gently moving it backwards and forwards. Break one end of the ring and bend it 90 degrees. Using a stone, sharpen the tip by rubbing it against the rough surface to create a sharp point. Now you have a makeshift fishing hook. Tie this to some string or fishing line, bait it up with worms, grubs or maggots, and you are good to go. The rest of the tin can can be used to make a candle lantern or stove. Using your knife and some gloves so you don't cut yourself, cut down the length of the tin can. Then make two more cuts across the top and the bottom of your first cut. It should form the shape of a capital I. Gently fold out the side walls of the can and you have a candle lantern with built-in wind deflectors. If you need to cook food or boil water, simply light a fire and add twigs to the stove. Place your cooking container on top and just keep feeding twigs to keep the fire going. You can get a much stronger flame by facing the opening of the tin can towards the wind. The extra oxygen being forced into the fire will result in a more efficient burn. Many coniferous trees produce resin, a sticky glue-like substance which helps the tree protect itself from various pests and heal any wounds from broken branches. You can collect the white resin using your knife or a stick. I would recommend using a stick as the resin is hard to get off your knife. Collect it in a metal container. A tin can works well. Put this on the fire and wait for it to melt. Once melted, it will look like black tar. This is called pitch. It is very flammable due to the high levels of resin. When it has cooled slightly, begin moulding it around a small stick. You can use your hand once it is cool enough to do so. Once it has completely cooled, it will go rock hard. This is nature's primitive glue. You can take it with you in your camping kit and melt it back down again whenever you need it. I used some recently to weather seal the mortise and tenon joints on the Anglo-Saxon house that we have been constructing. There is a link to this series in the video description. If you find yourself in the woods and you have no cup to drink or collect water from, then fear not. 
you can fashion one out of a stick. Find a stick or small log with a diameter of around 3 inches and a height of roughly 6 inches. Place your knife blade down the middle of the wood and carefully batten it down until the blade cuts through. Before you split the log entirely, make another cross section cut at 90 degrees to the one you just made. Now split the log into four separate pieces. Number each individual piece of the log on the underside using a pen, charcoal or a stick wiped in mud. This will help you piece them back together again when it comes to finishing the cup. On each individual piece, saw a groove about an inch above the bottom of the cup. Then use your knife to split the inner parts of the quarters off. Tidy these cuts up afterwards to make sure they are smooth and even. Now, when you put the pieces back together again, you will have a cavity. Fasten the cup together with some cordage. Here I am using bank line and a simple lashing. Make a loop, wrap your cordage around this loop, pass the tag end through the loop and pull it down into the lashing. There is a more detailed video on this on my channel. Now the cup is finished. Double check there are no gaps by holding it up to a light background such as the sky. Your cup will definitely leak slightly as water always finds the easiest route. However, if you submerge it in water for a few hours, the wood will absorb this water, expand and close the gaps. Hand sanitizer is in high demand these days, but it has more uses than just keeping your hands clean from the Rona. Alcohol-based sanitizers contain varying amounts and types of alcohol, often between 60% and 95%. The one I'm using here has a high percentage of ethanol, a flammable substance. Squirt some of this gel onto some wood and ignite it with a match or lighter. Although it looks invisible, there is actually a flame there. This is because ethanol burns with a smokeless blue flame that is not always visible in normal light. Hold a couple of sticks above it for a few seconds and before you know it, you will have yourself a fire. Lord Jesus, there's a fire. Ain't nobody got time for that. If you find yourself in the wilderness and you have no cordage, nature can provide. The roots of many conifer trees grow relatively shallow, even more so in densely populated woodlands where these trees are fighting for light. Simply use a stick and dig down a few inches until you find a root. Follow the root along and gently pull it up. Take off the rigid outer layer of the root using two sticks. This will expose the flexible inner layer. You can make the root even more flexible by further splitting it down with a knife. You can then take this one step further by bashing the roots with a stick to break up the fibres. If you soak them in water for an hour or so, this will make it easier to tie knots with. You can use the root as it is for a simple binding, or you can weave two or three roots together to make two or three ply rope. This will be much stronger than just the root on its own. Use the roots to lash sticks together when building bushcraft shelters or making primitive traps. If you can't get a fire going because the wood is wet, split it down to expose the dry inner wood. Using your knife at a shallow angle, gently carve off thin strips like a feather. Keep these feathers on the stick. Place your fire steel or ferro rod against the flat side of the stick and shower sparks onto the thin feathers. Doing it in this way means that you do not flick your wood shavings elsewhere and end up getting them wet. Gently rotate the stick to allow the flame to crawl up the wood shavings and get stronger. Quick tip, note that I made very small curls at the base of the stick when I finished. This is so that they are more likely to ignite when using a ferro rod. Clematis is a climbing vine that is commonly found in deciduous woodlands here in the UK. It has many uses. If you find yourself in the woods with no backpack or carrying container, you can fashion a basket using the vine of the clematis. You will often find it climbing up a large tree. Pull the vine down, but note, don't take the whole plant. One or two vines is all you need. You will need to gather various diameter of vine. The main frame of the basket needs to be about one to one and a half inches thick, and then some smaller, thinner ones are needed for the weave. Firstly, make a spider-like structure with three pieces of the large vine. Then, 
using the thinner diameter, weave in and out, going diagonally across the large vine each time. Once you have your main framework in place, you can begin your weave. Start with the thin vines and weave over and under the thick vines. Once you have weaved an area for the base of the basket, you can begin to use the thicker vines weaved in and out to create the basket itself. Finally, cut off the ends of the thick vine or fold them back into the basket and leave two opposite ends remaining. These can be lashed together to make a carrying handle. And now you have yourself a basket, which you could use for carrying your gear or harvesting wild edibles. If you have the need to chop firewood, but you have no solid chopping block, you can use a log laid horizontally on the ground. Lean the log that you want to split against this base log. Make sure only the top end of the log is touching the bottom log and chop down to split the wood. It is actually safer to do this with a longer axe and not a hatchet. Keep your knees bent and legs apart. That way, if you miss, your axe head gets buried into the ground and not into your foot. As a word of warning, it's probably best not to attempt this if you are a beginner and make sure the bottom log is on hard ground if possible. Do you find yourself having lots of loose cordage that is constantly getting tangled and messy? You can sort this by using a simple method to hang up your cord and keep it tidy. Place one end of the cord on the V in between your thumb and forefinger. Pinch it there and then loop the cord over your baby finger and round back over your thumb in a figure of eight movement. With a slight rotation of your hand, you can wrap the cordage fast and tighten it off around your finger. By wrapping up the cordage this way, you now have the option of quick deployment. By simply pulling on the cord, it will unravel fast and it's ready to use right away. No having to undo knots and tangles. If you wake up in the morning and your fire has completely gone out and there are no embers, you can still get it going again. As my friend Dustin from Bushcraft Tools demonstrates here, pick up some of the powdered white ash and fine grains of charcoal. Place this into some cotton wool and roll it into a tube-like shape like a cigarette. The tighter and more compact you roll it, the greater the chance of getting an ember. Using a flat piece of wood, begin rolling the cotton wool backwards and forwards, applying pressure as you do it. The laws of physics apply here. The downward pressure and backwards and forwards movement is creating friction, and friction creates heat, which, when hot enough, will warm up the ash and charcoal particles and create smoke. When you add oxygen to the cotton wool, an ember is created, and this can be placed in a dry tinder bundle. The cedar tree is one of nature's best providers of natural materials. It has so many uses, the leaves, branches, bark, and roots can all be used as either building materials or for fire lighting. It is also incredibly rot resistant, which is why it is commonly used to build log cabins and wilderness structures. The inner bark of cedar can not only be fluffed up and used as a tinder bundle, but it can also be split down and used as natural rope or cordage. I have used it to lash together a hazel frame when building a Native American wigwam. Similar to the tree root, when soaked in water, it helps to create a stronger binding. When the bark is damp and the log is holding plenty of moisture, it can be prized away from the log by hand. You can often peel the bark away from the log in one piece. This incredible resource can be used as roof tiles or shingles. We used cedar bark as the roofing material for our Viking house. If you would like to watch the Viking series, I will put a link to it in the video description. One thing to note when using cedar bark as a roofing material is that once it's peeled, it will start to dry out fast. When it dries, it shrinks. So we kept it wet by putting it in a lake overnight. We also use cedar bark for the roof of our Native American wigwam. It is certainly a resource our ancestors would have used. Potassium permanganate, pretty lengthy word. It's used for a number of skin conditions, such as fungal infections of the foot, dermatitis, and superficial wounds. 
but it can also be used to light fire. Sprinkle out some of the powder and pour in some vegetable glycerin, which is also widely used in the food, cosmetics and pharmaceutical industries. It can take a minute or so for the two products to react chemically with each other, but once they do, you will start to see the potassium permanganate bubble and smoke will be released. Soon after, the materials will burst into flame and you have yourself a fire. The lesser spotted dogfish are very common in UK waters. They are voracious feeders and can be caught from the shore or by boat. You can catch them on mackerel, squid or in fact most sea fishing baits. It is edible, although not eaten as much nowadays. However, the skin of the dogfish is very unique. It has the texture of sandpaper and it was once highly sought after to use when polishing wood. Word of warning, if you are squeamish, you may want to skip the next part. Once dispatched humanely, you can use a knife and a pair of pliers to peel off the skin of the dogfish. You can then use this skin straight up as sandpaper, or you can dry it out, which makes the denticles in the skin stand out more. This will make it more abrasive. As my dad demonstrates here on the YouTube channel TA Fishing, he's used it straight up and you can see it wearing the wood away. Often, when a head torch is left in a backpack, it bumps around and the torch gets switched on. You open your bag, only to find that the battery on your head torch is flat. Not a good thing to happen during a nighttime survival situation. To help prevent this, flip the battery around so that the positive and negative terminals are reversed. This should stop your head torch turning on automatically. Alternatively, you could add a small piece of blue tack or cut out card to create a gap that will prevent any electrical connection being made. The silver birch tree is one of the most resourceful trees in the world. It is fairly easy to identify with its silvery white bark being a standout factor. But even when dead and rotting, this tree can still provide a natural resource. When it's decomposing, the tree rots from the inside out, so the bark tends to be one of the last remaining pieces left. If you cut or pull the bark off, you can use it to light a fire, even in the wettest of weather. If you scrape away the outer layer of bark, you will see the red-orange inner layer. This is full of resin, which, when scraped into a dust pile, can take to flame incredibly fast. It also burns hot for a relatively long time, long enough for you to build an established fire. Duct tape, something we are used to seeing in a DIY or hardware store, but this should be one of the first items in anyone's survival kit. It has so many uses. You can use it to build shelters, repair clothing and tents, cover wounds to name just a few, but one thing that it is great for is fire lighting. In this example, I am using Gorilla Tape. You can hold a lighter to the tape itself and it will light easily enough. But what if you don't have a lighter or a match? If you use your knife, you can tear the tape into thin strips. If you bundle these strips together into a ball and shower sparks onto it from a ferrocerium rod, it won't be long before you see a flame. It also burns for a long time, giving you plenty of time to get your fire built up. Beware though, if you are lighting the tape in your hand, the flame will crawl up it fast and with the tape stuck to your hand, you could burn yourself. Probably best to light this one on wood or the ground. Sadly, plastic bottles are all too common in the wild these days, but they can come in useful in a survival situation. Cut the bottle in half, keep the cap on the top half, gather some moss and put this in first. The cap will stop this falling out. Compress this down and then add grass. Next, add some small stones and then a layer of larger stones. This layering system will help to catch dirt particles from muddy water. With another container, gently pour in the dirty water. The stones will catch the larger particles and the grass and moss will filter out smaller particles. You can already see the difference in colour with the first pour, but after two or three pours, you will really begin to notice a difference. Note that whilst this plastic bottle has filtered the water, it is still not completely safe to drink. You will need to boil the water afterwards in order for it to be drinkable. 
You can also use wood ash and charcoal from the fire or sand in part of your filter. Thank you for watching this video. I hope that you learned something from it and that you can apply some of these skills when you're out there in the wild. Big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring us. Remember, the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description will get two months premium membership for free. See you in the next episode.